It's great to be here. And it's especially great because once I heard about Tugboat, um, Jack had asked me to come. And I will tell you, talking to Dave and the whole team, I am so proud of you all. Evergreen companies are fabulous for the people. They're fabulous for all the things that I believe in. I have to tell you, um, to add to a little bit of, of Dave's story, it's funny, I came out of grad school and it, a few decades ago, and when I came out of grad school, everyone was going to work in a bank that had an MBA. So I went to work in a bank in Dallas, Texas, and I was asked to make a presentation to the board as the head of HR for that bank because we were going through a very tough time. It was a real estate crisis. And so I went up to make a presentation, and this individual uh, at the board meeting, it was all male, of course, and the individual said, will you come sit by me? And I said, sure. So I sat by him. And he said, when you make the presentation to the board, remember that you don't stand up. A little, a little weird, but OK. And when it was over, he said, don't stand up and shake hands as they leave. And I thought that, too, was weird. But I didn't do it. And when everybody was out of the room but he, myself, and this individual, I said, what made you say that? It, I don't have any impact. I'm not standing up. I'm the only female in the room. He goes, because, honey, you got toilet paper coming out of the back of your suit, and I, was, I thought you'd be embarrassed. <laughs> and that is how I met Herb Kelleher. <laughs> and he asked me the next day to come run uh, people and be the first people officer for Southwest Airlines. So <laughs> toilet paper works. Um, I'm so glad to be here. And I'm so glad that's how I started my journey, really realizing and getting to spend time in values-led organizations. And what I believe is, and what you're going to hear today, there are ways to build and run those organizations that will make you more successful. And many of you, and I hope all of you today, and I know you do, you have values in your organization. Whether you've defined them or not, they're there. They exist, because if you haven't defined them, what happens is they watch how you behave. So they know what the values are. Great organizations, and I will tell you one of my favorite organizations, um, is, is Salesforce. And Benny Off wrote a book a few years ago. And what he said was, he said one of the problems that he found as a leader was that when you aren't doing well, sometimes you forget to go back to the basics. And he went back, he wrote a book called Trailblazers. And when he was not doing well at Salesforce years ago, he said, I've got to turn this around and I've got to be successful. And he went back to the basics, which were the values that he lives and breathes in that organization. And I tell you that after being around great organizations, there are five things that they do really well. First of all, they really define who they want to be. They don't just let it happen. So they find these values, four to six values. Southwest only has three. But whatever number you want, but don't ever have more than six because people can't remember them. But they, not just define the, they don't just define the values. They define the behaviors that represent each of those values. And that's where we sometimes fail. We put words on a wall, but no one knows how to behave. And great organizations are all about behaviors. We say culture is a collection of behaviors of an organization. The second thing they do really well is they hire A players. A players, by definition, are people who have your competencies and the values. And there's a methodology for doing that that's been very successful in many organizations. Third thing they do is they have accountability and rewards. Accountability, accountability around the way you get the results. It's not just getting results. And they understand that every single person they hire represents their brand. Your people are your brand. When I was at Southwest, we didn't have any money for advertising. But you will see that we used our people in every ad. And to this day, 53 years later, you will never see an ad without their people in it. And last but not least, nothing works if everyone isn't engaged in understanding that the metrics are critically important. And they have to all understand every single number. I told Jack this story, and he always tells it. Um, at Southwest, we, we have profit sharing. And that's the only retirement vehicle. So our employees get paid, and at JetBlue, same thing, get paid before our shareholders. And what's really interesting is we try to make it simple. So at Southwest, you all remember, any of you, um, the plastic boarding passes we used to have. Well, number 77 
after 77, the 78th person boarding a plane made money for us. So we put red tape on number 77, so every employee would see who's standing at that gate when they took those passes, well, this next one is part of my profit sharing. Because continuous improvement in great organizations is the only way it works. So what I'm going to talk about is not soft and unmeasurable. Culture is very real. But having a set of values that everyone in the organization is engaged in and represents is how you become successful. First thing is you define who you want to be. Don't just let it happen. So many of us just let it happen. But define who you want to be by a set of behaviors and a set of values that are critical. We started JetBlue, and we were not supposed to make it. We started in 1999, and it was a 3.5% unemployment in New York at that time. About 12 airlines had gone, startups, had gone broke in the prior 18 months, and nobody wanted to work for an airline. And at the same time, we decided to fly out at JFK because there were 19 million people within a 60-mile radius, and no one had offered value price. Uh, values price flying for everyone in that area. Well, JetBlue today, 23 years later, has been very successful. But it was because of the people and because of the values. We sat in a room when there were nine of us. And by the way, five, the five founders of JetBlue, three of them came from Southwest. So we knew the numbers were important and we knew people were important. And we knew the values were critical. So we sat in a room in New York and we said, these are going to be the five values. And to this day, you won't talk to an employee at JetBlue 23,000 later that doesn't know those values. But the critical part was we defined the values with a set of behaviors. Because the one thing I said to David Nealman when he came to me and said, you've got to help me build JetBlue, and you've got to build an airline that all New Yorkers love. Does anybody know anything that all New Yorkers love? <laughs> I said, you're kidding. He said, no. But today, they're the favorite airline in New York. It didn't just happen. What we did was we defined who we wanted to be. We wrote the article that we wanted the Wall Street Journal to print five years later about us. And it happened. But it happened because we were committed to that set of values and that set of behaviors that today are part of the DNA of JetBlue. And I will tell you that Whatever you create, whatever you define, make sure it represents who you want to be collectively, the behaviors and the values. This is one from G5, which I just love. It's a tech company of the Northeast and Northwest, and they defined it. Now, I do tell people in the medical world, that last value will not work. <laughs> but I do believe that this has created, and the CEO always raves about it, that he, he brought all 90 people into the room that were part of the company. And Gail Watson, who is, part, is our COO of the company, will tell you, it was the most exciting group of young people sitting in the room and defining who they get to be and the company they wanted to work for. And it was a turning point for them. But they've been very successful because they didn't just put those words and behaviors on the wall. They hold everyone accountable for them. Please don't put the words on the wall and not understand that leaders drive those values. And that collection of behaviors that is created in your organization becomes a culture. Think about your favorite brand and think about why you frequent that brand. I frequent a brand not just because I want the quality of the products they, they represent, but because of the way I'm served. It's really important, and I think after COVID, it's become worse. It's almost like customer service doesn't exist. But it's all about you. It's all about how you behave and the kind of culture that you have created in your organization. And it's critical to pay attention to it like you do the numbers. And the second thing, I think the most important thing we ever do as leaders is to hire A players. A players, again, have the competencies and the values. B players have the competencies and the values, but the competency level isn't quite to the A player level. And C players are people that Howard Schultz says, and I agree with Howard, you send to the competition. <laughs> it just works, right? 
So when you hire someone, what you want to find out in terms of you find out all about the competencies you do, whatever you do looking for competencies, but you better also find out if they have the right values. And so what you do is you ask questions around the values like you ask questions around the competencies. Critically important because if you think about the last person that left or you had to let go, think about why you did it. It is typically not because they didn't have the competencies. But think about it because every single person you hire in your organization represents a brand. And in today's world, this just came out in the Wall Street Journal, and it talks about what people are working for, are looking for in an organization. And if you look at number four and you look at number five, stellar reputation and caring community. Really important and things we don't always think about. But even though we're laying people off in some of the tech world that you hear about out in Silicon Valley, I will tell you, Wall Street Journal was right when they said only 18% of the people looking for a job are A players. You need to make sure that you don't just recruit those A players. You build this community inside that people want to be part of. It's not easy. I'm not telling you that tomorrow you can do it. But it's a journey that really is worth taking. At JetBlue, one of the things we did after COVID is we gave everyone the right to stay home for two years because so many of our female employees could not find childcare. And if you think anything about an airline, it's not, uh, we can't let people stay home in an airline because who's going to fly the plane? But I did, it was really funny though, <laughs> one of the Southwest offer, um, captains during COVID, he's walking through the Houston airport and he has a white cane and he's got on dark glasses and he's pretending that he is blind walking through the airport. And he said, come fly with me. And I'm going, oh my gosh, but it was in the journal. So the sense of humor still um, exists. <laughs> but I will tell you during COVID, we came up with a lot of things that were very unique. Um, we also did one, we have every quarter, we allow people to go work in their community and we will pay them for that. And last year we had $1.2 million, I mean, I'm sorry, 1.2 million hours of community work. They loved it. Um, and we also then paid for close family funerals. And last but not least, we just graduated 135 people through an online um, University of Michigan program that we put together because so many of our employees wanted to go to school but had to work. So we put together a, an online program for them and in every single case, not one member of their family had ever gone to college. So think about benefits and think about creating new models for benefits, things that, and ask your people what they want. Because many times we spend money on things that they really don't care about. And I will tell you, Howard Schultz again was right. Um, share those C players with the competition. Uh, when I was in banking, we had this individual who ran one of our banks and he was Great at managing up, but absolutely terrible to his people. He didn't live any of the values of the organization. And since I had the file, I sent his resume to the competition. <laughs> and he, he called me one day and he said, everybody's calling me for an interview. I said, why don't you go? <laughs> and guess what? He found a job. <laughs> so don't tell me you can't do it. And don't let the lawyers tell you or anyone else tell you that, because there's always a way. Today you have to post on Indeed and they'll see it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Accountability and rewards are critical for high performing companies. Everyone has to know what the KPIs, what the goals are. And it's again, more, much more critical in these hybrid environments. Um, just a little fact, uh, JetBlue has had at home res agents for 23 years. Um, we've had one of those uh, people study us and they write articles about us because we're one of the first to ever have totally at-home agents, but we wanted to hire some of the younger mothers in Salt Lake City who wanted, didn't want to come to work because they had to leave the house, so they work at home. For 13 years, we won J.D. Power Award for airlines, which is unheard of, first time ever, and we have one of the lowest turnovers in the industry at 7% versus 25 
And I will tell you, it can be done, and I know it's difficult, it's not easy, but it can be done. But accountability and rewards should be unique to your environment. So make sure that you create a values recognition program and you have a values committee and have your A players on it, don't have your C pillars on it. It's like you don't want C players to hire people, right? I should have said that before, but I know you all know that. But a values recognition program is critical. You need to keep them alive and make them part of the DNA. Don't just think because you put words on a wall that people are going to live those words. We had a CEO in one of the companies we were working with, and he came up to me and said, those are great values after we did a blueprinting of his values. He said, those are the greatest values I've ever seen. I'm going to make every director and below behave like that. That is not going to work. It starts with you. But these recognition systems should be created by your people. Um, there was one company, it was a large hospital in California, and once they started looking at their values recognition program and profit sharing, what the people gave up was getting less, they would like to get less cash and they would like to be recognized in front of their peers. If you look at any of the data coming out, recognition is critically important. So make sure you have a recognition program around great behaviors. And as leaders, one of the things that you need to become is a great storyteller. But tell stories for a reason. Recently, uh, actually last Christmas, what happened was one of our call centers over in Salt Lake City, because they're, again, they're all at home. And so she got a call, one of the call center um, individuals got a call saying that a woman was just hysterical. And she said, I just landed in Puerto Rico, but I had to leave my service dog in New York because I didn't have the right paperwork. And she said, I just got over PTSD and I was going home to see my parents because they released me from the hospital and I thought I could get along without the service dog, but I can't. She had come to JFK and when she got there, she didn't have the right paperwork, so they had to send the, she um, put the dog in the kennel that's right next to JFK. So the individual who was in Salt Lake City, our customer service agent, called New York to see if anyone could go get that dog and could get the right paperwork so that this woman could have her dog. And it was December 23rd, and no one was available. She flew from Salt Lake City on the red eye. She flew to New York. She went and got the dog, and she went to a vet and got the paperwork. And she flew the dog to uh, Puerto Rico, and she got home Christmas morning. When the CEO called, because he heard the story, come, the, the customer called the CEO, and he heard the story, and he called her and said, oh my gosh, what made you do that? And thanked her, of course. And she said, one of our values is caring. When you tell stories, tell stories about people living the values. Don't tell stories like Susan called and said you were great. She's a wonderful customer. Really? Well, what did she do and why was she great? So tell them for a reason and get in the habit of doing that. And also, please start thinking gray. Do not think black and white for people anymore. Do not look at page 17 when Susan has a problem to see how you can resolve it. I'm telling you, you will not keep your A players. A players expect a differentiated treatment, and they deserve it. And I will tell you, I don't treat people any way but fairly, but I don't treat them equally. And the reason I don't is because they don't behave equally. And so what you want to do is make the right exceptions for the right reasons. So we had a pilot. He came to me and he told me that his child was very ill. She had a type of leukemia that the Boston Hospital, could, Children's Hospital, could treat, but no other hospital, and he lived in New York, in the New York area, could treat that child. He asked for a 90-day leave. Of course we gave it to him. He didn't ask at all for pay because he only had five days of, of leave coming, but we paid him. So when his chief pilot came to see me, he said, oh my God, the pilots are hearing that you paid him, because he told them, we didn't tell him. And so he, he came in and he said, what am I going to tell him? I said, this is what you're going to tell him. If they have a child who's terminally ill and need to go somewhere, we're going to pay them too. You know what he said? That works. <laughs> so please treat people fairly. 
and think about it and make the decision as leaders to think gray instead of black and white. It's never been more important because A players are still hard to find and harder to retain. And they're looking for you to be a caring community. And I don't care how large you are, you need to make those decisions on an individual basis. I will tell you, customer branding is critical. And to understand, and the decision I always make at the end of the day when I'm interviewing someone for um, one of the organizations that I work with, I will always say, do I want them to represent this brand? Really, really important. Every single person represents your brand. Every single person, you should take time hiring. They should have the competencies in spades, but they also need to have those values. It is extremely critical to your brand. We did some work with um, Bain, and we asked our loyal customers at JetBlue two years ago, what is it that, that causes our loyal customers to, to be loyal customers at JetBlue? And we use the net promoter score every single day. We ask for every flight, which is now about 1,600. We ask every passenger, would you um, get, rate, our, rate our customers and our employees? And would you r rate your experience as a customer? And we get very high NPS scores, but we don't compare to other airlines. We compare to the Amazons and the top um, organizations in the country. But we believe in net promoter score and have used it for years. And so I was betting, as a board member at that time, I was betting that our employees would come back, that our customers would come back and say, it's all about your people. So I paid them well, because that was the answer. 36% of their decision is to fly JetBlue is because of the people that serve them. It's no different than your organization. It's all about people. And you've heard it a lot. You have maybe think that it's soft and unmeasurable. I totally don't. I believe it's all about branding and having the values and hiring the right people. And at the end of the day, there's nothing more important than getting people involved and helping you make the numbers. So at JetBlue, we have an app. And when you turn on your phone, you see the numbers of the day and you see the day before. And it's coded red, yellow, and green. We have eight metrics that we look at. And what happens, they get to see not only the metrics for the whole organization and the NPS score from the day before, for their environment. So if you're in Fort Lauderdale, the technology will actually, our Fort Lauderdale people at the end of the day will tell the employees so that they can see it the next day what that NPS score was. Because we think it's critical that people know the numbers and they understand the metrics. The first day that you're onboarded at JetBlue, the first part of the day is the CEO himself will give you all the values and the behaviors that are expected of you. And at noon, when they're having lunch, he tells them, if you can't live these and breathe these, you literally, we will fly you home. The second half of the day, the CEO, I'm mean CFO, and the controller spend the entire afternoon talking about the numbers. And every employee learns to watch for those on their phone in the morning. But just in case they haven't turned their phone on, Every single building, every single location has a flat screen TV where they check in and it has the numbers for the day. And every single employee knows those numbers. I know now you're going to ask them if you fly JetBlue and I'm going to be screwed on that day. They won't have turned on their phone. No, I'm kidding. But um, I will tell you, continuous improvement and having employees involved in the numbers is critical. And we tell them the numbers, and we send them accolades for achieving those numbers. And we continue to reinforce that the values are critical, the behaviors are critical. And as a result, we have success also financially. I know that it sounds like it is hard, but those five pieces, I will tell you, have to be involved. You have to blueprint who you want to be. Don't just let it happen. But the behavioral part is so critical. Then that gives you the basis for hiring A players, because now you're hiring to behaviors. And the fourth thing is to understand reward systems don't have to be monetary. You know, the Southwest has never given bonuses that are for doing a great, they actually have salary increases like everyone else. But you hear about these huge bonuses that corporations give, they don't do that. But they recognize people, in fact, 
when Kelleher was still the chairman, I, myself or anyone who got an accolade from a customer would get a handwritten letter at home. He would spend every single Sunday writing those letters. At JetBlue today, every single Sunday night, the CEO sends emails to every employee talking about the week, giving them the numbers, telling them where we did the right thing or perhaps were challenged and didn't succeed as well. And last but not least, tells a story about one of the values being lived by one of the employees. It is a system of value, values building companies. It isn't a one-time event. Many of us think once we describe the values, it's a one-time event. It's not a one-time event. And if you want to go down as your legacy being one where people respected you and honored you and really appreciated what you brought to the table, remember that's every day in your behaviors. You don't get to have an excuse for not living the values. But you can all do it, and I know your values-driven organizations, or you probably wouldn't be um, sitting here in this audience. And thank you for everything you do. And remember, it is important to be a leader of consequence. I think it's a goal we should all have. And thank you for listening, and thank you for being here.